Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Greening Your Craft, supported by BAFTA. Um, my name is Carly McLaughlin. I'm the Deputy Director for the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research here at the University of Manchester. Um, and we work across quantitative and qualitative issues to do with energy uh, emissions reductions. Uh, I'm going to try and speak as little as possible and leave it all to our panellists, who I'll briefly introduce before asking them to speak for around five minutes each on what they're doing in terms of sustainability uh, and what barriers and opportunities they're facing. Um, so from my left, we have Claire Pugh-Williams, who is the production co-coordinator for CBBC's How to Be Epic at Everything. Uh, then we have Richard Smith, who is the St Sustainable Production Manager at BBC. Then Tracy Davids, the Production Manager at Premier League Productions IMG Media. And finally, Francis Gilson, Associate Producer for BBC Comedy. So, um, I'm going to start with you, Claire. You've made the mistake of sitting next to me. Oh. If you can just tell us a bit about uh, what you do uh, generally and then what you're doing in terms of trying to make that more sustainable. Well, um, at the BBC we're really up for creating new green sustainable productions and um, the last programme that I worked on was Mr Bloom's Nursery which was, um, it was a real uh, challenge to work on that show and try and keep it green because for series three we did a UK tour so the nature of the production to start with wasn't particularly uh, you know, easy to manage. So we had to really have a think about how we could really look into making it a green production. So what we did for that was um, we sort of we had a lot of people touring around the country. So we ended up putting people in the same cars, travelling together. You know, keeping our emissions down. Uh, we also actually asked our freelancers who sometimes had worked together before to join, you know, be in the same vehicles and things like that, which was great and really, really helped us tour effectively around the UK. Um, it's other things like everybody that's sort of worked on a production would know that during production you supply water bottles and everything to people and crew and it's very easy to sort of have a water bottle, you know, have a couple of sips, then the camera guys, you know, or lighting guys that throw them away. You know, we are also people that do that as well as a production team. So we were just making it really easy for people to manage that by giving them personalised water bottles for each shoot so that we were... It, it's really small things that actually add up into a really quite an important part of keeping it really reduced and really green production. Um, so yeah, Mr Bloom was a really sort of, it, it in itself is very sort of supportive to um, sort of you have your vegetables and your, you know, things that happen with Mr Bloom, which is actually what you need to keep keep green um, as a brand and uh, so we had to really do our best in that way. Um, obviously our, look, our recycling services, uh, uh, the BBC, BBC North in fact is um, a sort of paperless environment so that in itself is, well supposedly, <laughs> but it does its best to kind of promote paperless working and, and things like that you know and we work very closely with Richard um, who supports us in doing so on each production. Um, I think by using Albert which is a carbon calculator we're able to manage sort of the the greener production prior to actually going out on production so you can maintain so you can manage sort of what mileage you're going to travel what hotels you're going to put people in so that you're actually able to monitor that and you're thinking about it prior to sending out crews and freelancers on shoots you know and things like that so um yeah it, it was quite a challenge that one and i think um the locations that we had to use were a bit, there were parts of Mr. Bloom's nursery which was very difficult um, to manage because we had to go to certain locations sort of in Scotland or in Wales and we weren't as able to kind of manage those aspects but the parts where we could do we would do so effectively so uh, yeah that's a little bit okay great <laughs> thank you very much um, are there any points of clarification anything that anybody wants a little bit more detail on there we'll come back to a sort of fuller discussion and questions from the floor once everyone's spoken but if anyone's got a burning point of clarification no burning points of clarification, that's very good. You were obviously very Thank clear. You. Um, you mentioned the Albert calculator, which hopefully our next panellist can tell us a little bit more about. Uh, so over to you, Richard. Okay, so um, my name's Richard Smith, and I work for the BBC, and I've got a really, well, feel in a position of great privilege because I work with people like Claire and Francis and indeed Tracy from a different company um, to help them make their programmes in a more sustainable way. 
Uh, and that could be anything from things like, you know, trying to sort out the water bottles right through to really big, exciting issues like, you know, can we, can we get solar power onto the set of Doctor Who, which is something I've been looking at this week. So anything and everything that will help people, help program makers make their programs in a more sustainable or environmentally friendly or green way, because there's, there's, no, there's no lengths in terms of dumbing down that I won't go to to try and help people understand what this is all about. So I try to avoid the word sustainability, stick with the words environment, green, if that's what it takes to get people engaged. Get them to think of anything and everything that they can do to try to make a difference in the way that they make their programs. And um, specifically this thing, Albert the Carbon Calculator, which some of you perhaps might have heard of. Um, it's a really simple thing. It's an online tool. It's a carbon calculator, which means that it tells you what the carbon impact of, of an activity is. And in Albert's case, what it does is work out what the carbon footprint of your production is. And it gives you a figure around CO2, carbon dioxide, per hour of output. Um, I hope it's a really simple thing to use. As I'm sure the panelists may tell you, uh, it's far more difficult to actually gather the information and give yourself an accurate footprint than it is to actually put the stuff in in the first place. But what we found about Albert um, is that it's kind of like the glue that holds the whole of the BBC sustainable production work together. Because if we didn't have something like Albert, where we were measuring our impact. Everyone could be off doing their separate things uh, and we wouldn't know whether or not we were really focusing on the right thing. So it's fantastic that productions are concerned with things like getting rid of water bottles and, and so on. But if the fact remains that your carbon footprint is really big, you know, we've still got to focus on that issue and not lose sight of that. So Albert, um, it's absolutely not the end in itself. It's a means to an end and the, the cheesy, um, kind of analogy that I always use is that if I wanted to go on a diet, the first thing that I would do is get on the set of scales to see where I'm starting from. And Albert is the set of scales for carbon in TV production. It's not perfect. There, there will always be things that we need to do to improve. Um, but it seems to have taken some kind of foothold in the industry. Uh, other production companies are using it. In fact, I heard this morning that 50 production companies and broadcasters are now signed up to using Albert, which I'm really thrilled about. And I hope that as much as uh, the number that you get out the other end of Albert telling you how much your, your, what the carbon footprint of your production is, simply the process of using this tool will help people think about things that they didn't think about before. Um, so my job on a day-to-day -day basis um, is really to encourage people to use Albert, but just as importantly to think about what they could do differently. And as I say, it's a real privilege to be working with, with the people who make such fantastic programs, no matter what company or, or uh, broadcaster they work for to help them try and be more green. Great, thanks very much. If, if Albert is a carbon calculator, um, what's the role of these other sustainability, other green things that you're talking about that might not get down to a carbon metric, but are, are wider kind of good things to do? What, what's yeah. the relationship between them well, and how do you communicate that? Well, so I don't need to, is my microphone still on? Can you hear me yes. okay? Yeah. Um, I won't need to tell you this, but, but you know, sustainability as a kind of more technical definition involves uh, this kind of uh, coming together of financial, of social and environmental. And hopefully you've got a sweet spot in the middle where you know, you're saving money, everyone's happy and hopefully being more prosperous and it's good for the planet as well. And that's our kind of dream scenario is to kind of find, find measures that will tick all three of those boxes. In very practical terms, as far as I'm aware, the biggest impact of the BBC at the moment in terms of those three things that we need to move on is the environmental. So we're kind of unashamedly focusing on environmental measures when we talk about sustainability. That's not to say that we don't care about the money. The BBC very much does care about money. That's not to say that we don't care about social impact. We very, very much care about social impact. But I hope that the quality of, of what the, the, you know, the content of the programmes themselves, and this is absolutely critical to something like Mr. Bloom's Nursery, which I'm very familiar with Mr. Bloom, bless him, because my son is a big fan. <laughs> you know, the, the content of these programmes does have a social worth in itself. And I think we shouldn't lose sight of that when we're talking about what the carbon footprint of some productions are. That it could be a price worth paying. It often is a price worth paying to deliver such a positive message environmentally and socially in terms of what impact that can have on the audience. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Has anyone got any specific questions for Richard at this stage about Albert or any of the things he spoke about? I know one of you is going to want to ask where do we get the name from, so we could just get it out of the way now. Yeah, where did you get <laughs> no, the name from? Uh, it's too boring to say, but it's not very interesting. It doesn't stand for <laughs> anti-low emissions reduction. <laughs> or any, does that even spell Albert? It probably no. doesn't. I missed the B out. It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. It's just, it's just Albert. Like Orange, you know, the mobile phone company. 
or whatever it is, is just okay. orange, and Albert's just Albert. It's a massively <laughs> underwhelming explanation. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, built, I really Thank built you. that up too much. <laughs> okay, but, but, okay, so no particular source for Albert. Um, Tracy, can you tell us a bit about what you're doing to try and be okay. more sustainable in your role? Okay, I'm uh, Tracy Davis. I'm a production manager at IMG. I work in their uh, Premier League department, so that's the... Uh, football, we represent um, the Premier League and their international programming. We're kind of, I don't know, I probably see us as the little baby brother or sister to uh, the BBC. We've been um, looking at sustainability within our company for about the last um, 18 months or so. So um, we kind of very much look to them as uh, the kind of the flagships. But things that we're doing at IMG is um, the program I work on is the magazine shows, the outside broadcasts, and the studio output. So we are moving away in our studio environment from tungsten lights to um, LED lights, which are, give off lower emission and are um, obviously better for the environment. Um, we're, in terms of our OB providers, we're hoping that as we, you know, as their vehicles uh, kind of get into the end of their life, they'll start looking at more environmental um, components to put into new um, um, trucks as they um, produce those. They're also looking at um, more environmental tyres so that they'll use less fuel when they're on the road going, because obviously if we've got a game in Manchester, most of our trucks probably will have come from around the country. So, you know, fuel is obviously a big part of um, getting everyone from A to B. So hopefully with some of the changes that they're hoping to make, these things will have an impact um, on the environment. Um, we are also, um, since we've started um, being more kind of sustainable, um, our offices um, were due to move next year. And one of the things we're kind of looking at is low energy lighting um, at the new premises, solar paneling potentially on the roof if we can get the uh, permission from the freeholder. Um, we use a green um, taxi company um, across the company. They run on um, electric, a um, bit more expensive probably than a kind of standard company, but we've decided that it's the, the way forward. And obviously the more business they get from us, the more competitive their prices will be. So we're trying to roll that out across the uh, company. Um, we've also, our department was the first to kind of get uh, rid of individual dustbins underneath everyone's desks. So now we have kind of central points where we put recycled waste or general waste. Um, we're also looking at potentially um, food waste um, in our catering department. So it's very similar to um, what people have in some of their homes. You've got like little mini bins that the dustbin come and take away once a week or whatever. Um, we're trying to see if we can do something similar, if not where we are at the moment, but at the, the new offices that we're moving to next year. Um, i trying to think what else out of my list. Um, I mean, that's kind of about it really for us. As I said, we're quite new to it. We've kind of embraced it. Um, I train uh, all the production managers at IMG to kind of, we, we're quite, um, we've got about 30 production managers, mainly staff, some freelancers. And, I've trained them how to use the Albert um, calculator system. Um, I think initially there was kind of, you know, a bit of resistance to that, but I think as we've kind of gone on and, I mean, a lot of the stuff we're doing anyway, like we wouldn't send, you know, five people to the same location in five different cars. We try carpooling, you know, if it's cheaper to, you know, get people to travel by train, um, you know, we're kind of tying all these things um, together but um, yeah I think it's going fairly well at the moment. I'm interested in the green taxi idea. Yes. Are you trying to get people out of using taxis as well as having a green taxi company or are you happy for them to keep using taxis because we will, um, it's We're always going to need taxis. A lot of the stuff we do especially on location or if you've got guests etc need to get from A to B. A lot of people don't live in London so they might get a train down. Yeah. And it's, you know, depending on what time of night they're working and stuff, they will need, you know, So it's transport. identifying that kind of critical activity and exactly. looking at how you can green it rather than yes. going down a road where you can't get any behavioural change anyway. No. So. Okay. And we found, I mean, the, I think there are two... I mean, we started using the green company about 18 months ago and there were two companies in London that um, have a kind of taxi service. And there was, we, we're based in West London and one of those was in West London that was kind of the deciding factor really between the two because they were very similarly priced but we kind of went with they'd have more cars in kind of our area so what's the point of coming from say Islington in North London across to West London so that was kind of like the main 
complain at why he went with that one. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Um, Does anyone have any specific questions for Tracy on what she said? Nope, very clear again. I'd just like to say... Oh, yeah, go for it. (laughs) Tracy's selling herself a bit short on (laughs) IMG because what IMG have done Mm. most critically, along with that huge list of things that they're trying to do, is IMG is showing leadership in this area, and that's what we absolutely critically need. You know, we don't just want this to be the same old companies doing, doing the same things, talking to each other about how great they are all the time. We need companies that are going to be prepared, particularly from the commercial sector, to stick their, stick their heads above the parapet and say, we care about this and we want to do something. And that's what IMG uh, are doing and have, have done. And they were one of the founders of something that, that we could talk about uh, later if there's time. Um, a partnership across the TV industry that's been brought together and chaired by BAFTA. And IMG were one of the founders of that. And... Um, you know, the fact that they're doing that in addition to all those practical measures in-house is very, very significant because the people who are the leaders in this field now, uh, I think that will bring them reputational benefit, I hope, in, it, in itself it, because it, they will show their customers, their audience, that they care, the supply chain. Um, but it also points a way forward to people in the future. And ultimately, you'll, I hope, as this all gathers much more momentum, it will be the companies that, you know, to if you're not involved in this kind of thing, there'll be a reputational risk rather than a reputational benefit, which is what the, the, the early uh, adopters are, are having at the moment. Okay, great. Thanks very much. And Francis. Uh, hello, I'm Francis Gilson. I'm an associate producer for BBC Comedy. Um, I think, actually, the first thing I'd like to do is uh, just show you a short sketch uh, to show how seriously BBC Comedy is taking the whole uh, sustainability and uh, environmental practices, if we can play that in now. Red, you're going to be covering the front entrance while we slip out the side door. Mr Black, you're going to have the car ready to go, and we're away. So, thank you very much, gents. Let's go. Excuse me. Excuse me. So, uh, what is it now, Mr Green? That's right, Mr Green. As the environmental officer of this job, there are a few concerns that I'd like to flag up. Yeah, look, we've got to catch them between shifts, Just right? We've got to go. I think we agreed that we would be a carbon neutral bank robbing firm by 2015, didn't we? <laughs> well, it was more of an aim. It was a promise. No, no, it was never a definite. You signed a pledge! All right, that's enough, that's enough. We did sign a pledge. And we haven't even reached the interim target. First up, this get away vehicle. What is that we're going to have there? I'll start with a Jaguar and change the plates. And you didn't even go for a diesel option, did you? No. That's very irresponsible, especially if we're going to go accelerating away at speed. Are we, are we going to try and accelerate away at speed? Well, of course we are. Well, we should have gone for an electric vehicle, shouldn't we? They're easy enough to nick. You just have to unplug them. <laughs> Number two, Mr Blue, what have you got in a way of weaponry there? Ah, oh, that's good, yeah, that's wood, isn't it? Because that is green. But have you got a certificate showing it was sourced from a sustainable forest? No. <laughs> well, we are not taking this seriously, are we, gentlemen? Well, get green tomorrow. Right now we're running out of time. I'll tell you another thing that's running out of time. This planet of ours. <laughs> if we don't do something about it, there won't be a world for our kids to rob and thieve in. Think about it. There won't be any witnesses for you to intimidate. There won't be a pit bull so you can sell it on some grass. There won't be any of Mother Nature's bounty to turn into narcotics to sell in that fish and chip shop of yours in Romford. Is that what you want? No. (laughs) You're right. We can make a difference. It's up to each and every one of us to make that change for a cleaner future. Come on, boys, we can be mean and green. Yeah, let's go for it. After we've had a health and safety presentation from Mr Orange. Let's go, let's go. Oh, 
What are you doing? We're offsetting the carbon emissions from the crime of the century, madam. That's it, come on, go! Uh, so anyway, that's the um, BBC Comedy Department being uh, carbon neutral. Um, for, for myself, I think I realised that possibly we ought to be doing more in that direction. Um, a few years ago, even before Albert um, was in existence, I was working on a show called Jam in Jerusalem, and uh, the star of the show, show Sue Johnson, um, when she was going home, I saw her going home with a huge bag of um, plastic bottles in, in a, the cruise water bottles. She was taking them home to recycle them. I thought there's, there's probably more we should be doing on that front. And I guess that's the point, because we're all doing it at home anyway. We all separate our, our rubbish. We use low energy light bulbs. We do those things. But somehow, shooting on location or in studios, and it becomes so big and so complicated, it kind of goes out the window. But I think the point is, if you can actually build it in at the start, this is what I've found anyway, if you can actually involve people from the beginning, build it in at the start, people are... People are... Um, <laughs> people, oh, people, people are very receptive, <laughs> and um, I think uh, also what's good at the moment is, um, in terms of technology, we've reached a kind of tipping point, um, particularly in the lighting and camera side of things, where um, the the new cameras coming in, particularly the Alexa, work very well at low because they're very much more sensitive, work with low lighting levels, and the lighting itself. Uh, the new LED lights are coming in, and in fact, uh, I mean, that's the sexy stuff that's coming in now, and it's sort of still being tried and tested, I think, but the, the fluorescence that we've all been using for a number of years, observe the rig up here, um, I think there's great gains to be made in that way, and there's, there's other benefits I've found as well. Um, so recently, um, trying to book stages in the London area, uh, it's, it's very busy out there. Most of the sort of usual suspects, Pinewood, Shepparton, and so on, have been booked by American companies making films, it's actually quite hard to get uh, studio space. So we're pushed to the outer limits into places that have gone bankrupt or um, uh, uh, former warehouses that aren't very well soundproofed. And um, as well as more vermin, they, these places tend to have not very good power supply. So you should take your gaffer electricians along there on a recce. The first thing they want to do is get a massive generator in. They, they love a generator. But in fact, if you're using um, a low energy lighting sources, you can actually cut the power consumption to, in such a way that it's possible to use the existing power supply. So um, for a couple of productions we've done recently, um, we changed the sort of the conventional space lights and um, uh, cyclorama lighting, um, which are basically great big power hungry heaters, which chuck out a little bit of light as a byproduct. Change those to fluorescents, the flow banks, and image 80s and actually cut, cut the, uh, the power consumption to such an extent it was about 180 kilowatts we managed to get it reduced by which meant we could use the existing power supply we didn't have to get a generator in uh, which is you know, a very inefficient and expensive way to generate power um, I mean I, I, I costed it out the generator itself would be 10,000 pounds to hire and but the fuel for the time we were there would be another 20,000 pounds to go down the conventional route so Although the lighting itself is more expensive to hire because it's newer technology, in fact, there are other savings. So it, um, there, there are benefits if you kind of look for it. And as I say, people tend to be quite receptive to it because we're all doing it. Um, so I would say my, my, my top tips uh, for a more sustainable way of working are to involve people earlier on, particularly the heads of department, uh, get them on board, um, get your caterers on side, um, make sure they're aware of that that's what you're aiming to do. We also gave out our plastic bottles. It's always about plastic bottles in the end. We gave out reusable ones. People put their name on it, and then you just give them tap water. You don't have to um, do this thing. It's, it's small things like that. Talk to the DOP particularly. Talk to the lighting hire companies. Um, look at where the stages are, where you're actually doing the filming in terms of public transport, that kind of thing. Uh, Get people on board with the whole idea of car sharing and transport sharing. Um, 
I possibly oversold it by saying there could be, you know, a, a romantic bonus to that, which I think, you know, maybe was overstretching it. But, it, you know, whatever, whatever works. But uh, I would say pick your battles because what I found well, a step too far was Meat Free Monday. Unfortunately, that didn't work for us. It's a, apparently a fundamental human right for electricians to have dead pig at breakfast. There's no way around that. And uh, lastly, uh, use Albert, uh, the, the Albert calculator. If you can fill that out, it just, I mean, the way I've been using it is to fill it out before the production. So it's with the sort of projected um, uh, calculation. So, and then it, it's a way of looking at where, you, where your energy consumption is, uh, you know, and, and also hopefully a way of reducing that. So then I could then fill that out after the production had finished with the actual values to see if we'd actually made any difference. Okay, so it's your turn now. Questions from the floor, please. Okay, yes. Uh, can you just hang one second because there's a mic that's going to come to you, I think. And can you uh, can, can you say can you say who you are before you ask your question, please? Is there a mic coming? Was that was that a terrible lie? Thank you for your mic. My name's Alan O'Duffy. I'm a um, production sound mixer and you know when we get reams and reams of script uh, through and then we get the updates as another ream of script and, da, 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 and then everybody gets sides every day I'm just wondering w w can we migrate to Nexus Google and iPads and all the rest as, as a production uh, suggestion for uh, saving a few forests thank you does anyone want to respond to that do you think that's a possibility um, well, I saw a product uh, on Monday, which some of you may already be aware of, and forgive me if I'm you know, saying something that's been around for 10 years and you're going, what planet is he from? Uh, something called Final Draft, which is a software program where people write scripts. Uh, I was seeing a demo of this on Monday where they've now got a way of doing it, and all, all, you know, all the sides are colored pink, pink, blue sides, all the revisions and so on. Well, I don't know how it works, but basically you can now download it to your, uh, uh, your, uh, you know, your mobile device, whatever it may be. And so if one person who's, who's controlling the scripts um, makes an amendment, somehow they beam it out to all the other ones straight away. So basically, if everyone was carrying a device, whatever it, whatever it was, uh, hopefully a device that they're not updating every six, six months, by the way, when a new version, new sexier version comes out, then yes, I would see that that would eliminate the need for the constant paper revisions. Um, I suspect, and Francis will probably be able to say more than me and Claire, it, I suspect it's more of a cultural thing that people want that bit of paper in their hand and it's someone's job to always hand out that bit of paper. I don't want to do that person who hands out the bit of paper out of a job, but it would seem to me that they could spend their time doing other things rather than handing out bits of paper. But tell me if I've got it wrong, you know. Well, I mean, I, with Mr. Blooms, we did a studio section to the tour and uh, they, you're absolutely right, there were stacks of scripts, you know, um, available to people and I think a way to manage that is there are people that do like, you know, obviously if they're in the gallery, they're going to be marking on the scripts throughout and there are positions that require the sort of the paper version saver script. Um, you know, obviously anything that we print off, we obviously recycle straight away anyway. Um, so nothing does go to waste. So you are sort of managing it in that way. But whether we need sort of extensive scripts available to the whole crew or whether there are specific positions that do just need the hard copy and then anyone else gets it generated electronically to them would probably be a better way to sort of manage that, I would say. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, uh, yeah I think that's true. It's sort of, um, it, it, it's ways of, um, of managing it, really. We try to send out early drafts as uh, PDFs so that people are reading them, ideally on their laptops, rather than printing them off. If they do need a hard copy, early drafts tend to get sent out double-sided, so we're not... Um, Using, you know, using as little paper as possible. And yet yeah, the revisions, when they come out, it's not a whole new script. It's just the pages that are needed with the final draft very often. Mm -hmm. if, if we can use that, if the writer is, is up to using that, then it, it's, it's just, the, the, just the pages that are needed and the revisions are very clear. So it's, it's just ways of minimizing it, really. Thanks. Another question, please. Come on, don't be shy. When I say I'm only going to ask one more question, four of you will put your hand up. So just imagine I've said that now. <laughs> that question that you really want to ask, but you're a bit shy, madam. You look like you might have a question. 
Well, fortunately, I have one prepared while well, you can think of one. Um, you've all spoken very optimistically about this. It's all, it's, all, it's all happening. Everyone's really on board. So are you giving us a kind of glossy account and actually there was opposition to it? And if not, how far would you have to push it before you would start to get opposition and how do we get to that next level? I think there's always um, resistance at something new. You know, you're on a busy production, you're doing X, Y, and Z already, and then in comes something else that you've got to kind of factor in. Um, I think, yeah, I think especially where I work, there was a lot of kind of, oh, what, what, what benefit is this? Why have we got to do it, etc. cetera? But um, I think once we kind of explain that a lot of the stuff you're doing already, like France is, you know, recycling paper, um, carpooling, etc. you know, less bottles, getting rid of your waste, you're kind of doing that at home and you're also doing that to a certain degree. I know where I work, we recycle anyway. So it's not, I think initially you think, wow, this is something new, we're going to have to kind of start from scratch. But a lot of the elements are kind of second nature if you kind of break it down a bit. And also it's not something that's implemented and you've got to do it 100%. It's very much in chunks um, as you get you know, more um, involved and more experienced in doing it, then you kind of increase and do more things. But I don't, it's not a kind of, this is an edict, it starts running from today and it's all got to be perfect. It's very much an ongoing process, I'd say. I think um, there's no doubt that you know, things are definitely moving in the right direction. So I've, I've been doing this job for about three years. And uh, three years ago, you know, if I could get in the room with somebody like Francis, it'd be like, oh, brilliant, you know, put that on your appraisal. Got a, got a meeting with a production manager, you know, really, really exciting. But now, there's, it's not like one production manager a week. It's, it's like six or seven a day. And there's undeniably a growth in it. And I don't, the, the days when I'm kind of sitting down having to say to people, no, you, you know, we think green is a good thing to do. It, it, you completely cut out that conversation because everybody gets it straight away. This is not to say, of course, that just because they're getting a meeting with me and, I, and they're saying the right things and they're using Albert and they're measuring their footprint that they're actually doing anything about it. I think the vast majority are doing something about it. And I think, you know, people who work in TV are just like people on the street. They are people on the street and everyone's got a slightly different view about how green they want to be. You know, there's probably 50 shades of green like that book. Is that great? <laughs> 50 shades. So, um, and some people are deeply green, others less so. Um, but I think it's got to be about continual improvement. We're not expecting people to go from, you know, nothing to carbon neutral or whatever it was in that clip that uh, Francis has kept up his sleeve for the past three years and never shared with me before <laughs> until today. Thank you for that, Francis. Um, you know, we're not expecting them to go from nothing to 100% perfect straight away. It's always going to be about uh, continual improvement, encouraging people, celebrating the positive and not dwelling on the negative, which again might sound a bit sickly sweet to some people, but there is no other way of doing it because there is no point in dwelling on the negative. There's a million and one reasons why the industry isn't already more, more green than it is, but you know we're all champions within our organisations trying to focus on what can be done and sharing that with, with everybody else. Having said all that, I'll probably go back to the office and there'll be some horrible email there saying I can't get involved, so we'll see. <laughs> is, there, is there something as the sustainability guy at BBC that you would like to get your teeth into that you think actually that's, you know, we can't go there yet. It's, that's yeah, a longer I mean, the, term. The thing, the thing that I would really... People are really, really good now at doing the things that they are very much in control of, like eliminating these bottles. Thank you to BVE for giving us them, uh, so I don't want to sound critical. Um, but the, the, the things that I would really like to see change are, are things that now I think are more about a technical process of moving away from, you know, smelly, inefficient diesel generators and moving on to renewable energy sources, portable renew, renewable energy sources um, when we're out on location. So whether that be solar power or whether that be something called uh, WVO, waste vegetable oil, which is basically chip fat that you're sticking in a generator. You know, if you can use WVO or solar, you're going to massively, massively reduce the carbon impact of your work on set. And unfortunately, you know, at the moment, the kit are trying to deploy that on a, on a, on a power-hungry set. A solar panel, any number of solar panels, just isn't going to be able to provide the amount of oomph that you need. Um, there's issues around existing supply chains. Do our, do our current uh, generator providers, can they work with chip fat in their generators? Can they modify them? It, things like that are really, really difficult to turn around. So that's the thing that I want to kind of keep bashing away at. And I think I have to accept that in the short term, at least, even if I can get just a bit of solar on a set here and there, 
hopefully that will start to snowball and, and convince people that it's not a scary technology, that it does work. But it's, you know, that, that's, that's for some way off in the future. In the meantime, please, everybody, do what you can wherever you can. And don't worry too much about the solar-powered, you know, uh, Winnebago. <laughs> Would anyone else like to add anything to that one? Or should we see well, if... Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, I think the trick of the trade with production is that if you get people engaged from the outset, then, you know, we've got it involved in our, even our production budgets now when we go to Greenlight, we've got, you know, a section on how to be green, how's this production going to create, you know, be sustainable. And um, I think really if you can get everybody on board from the outset and people thinking about it right from the beginning, I think that... That's almost people. It becomes habit once you start to enforce it regularly. Um, it's obviously going to be something that um, people sort of aren't thinking about immediately at the, you know, at the moment. A, a lot of our productions within BBC Children's are, you know, and it's actually part of our, you know, when we start a new production, it's actually part of our setup to sort of be thinking about these things. But I think from the outset, if you can get people involved and thinking about it right from the very beginning, it just makes the whole production flow a lot easier and and. For that then to spread when people move on to different productions you kind of you know it sort of spreads out completely and adds a bit of a network to it Great, okay. so and, uh, I mean following on from that <laughs> if, you, if you do involve people earlier on it's very often it, their own particular area of expertise they will give you suggestions about things that you can do so uh, I think an example was on a program I did called Mongrels the, the meeting we had with the marketing people we explained how we were trying to be a more sustainable production and they came up with loads of ideas to do with the packaging for the marketing not at it, not having packaging just having barcodes things like that so if you, when you involve people very often you'll get things back that you haven't even thought of yourself okay that's great so in some ways it's like any kind of change management process really isn't it you're engaging the people that's going to affect and, and bringing them in to to improve it and make it work smoothly yeah okay great um is there a question out there yet <laughs> Is there anyone here who thinks it's a load of, you know, it can't be done within the industry that we've got? Well, that's nice. Well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Tell your friends. Positive. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, if, the, if there aren't any uh, further questions, I'm going to just ask our panellists, maybe you, Richard, to tell us how people out there could get more involved, because you mentioned that before, what, what networks and sources of information are Gosh, out there. I mean, there's, there's, there's a great deal out there now. Um, I mean, a really key thing is that, you know, it, to, to talk about this within your colleagues, talk about it to your boss, or if you're already the boss, talk about it with the people who are, who are working to you. Don't be embarrassed to be the one who shows that you care for all the, you know, the blindingly obvious reasons. But if, you know, if the moral reason isn't imperative enough, then the financial reason, the legislational reason, the reputational reason, the reason about, uh, about, about business resilience, you know, there's... Now, if, if more climate change related incidents happen, there's going to be more situations like uh, Hurricane Sandy, which some people are directly attributing to climate change, and that puts the security of your business at risk. Um, going off, a little, off tangent a little bit, I would just say that a very, very basic thing to do would be to get in touch with BAFTA. So if you, if you go onto the BAFTA website, look for sustainability there. Uh, that's got a lot of information. It's got links to, uh, about how you can um, start using Albert, the carbon calculator. Albert is free. It will remain to be free, I hope forever, but certainly as long as we can possibly afford it to be free. Um, there's a range of information available. There's, there's, there's fact sheets. You know, you can get in touch with me at any time. My email's out there, probably in a thousand places. And, um, you know, if you've got any advice or, or you need any information rather, then, then come to me. But so many companies are involved. I mean, there's somebody sitting in the audience now who I'm not going to embarrass because I suspect she wouldn't want me to do it. But there's somebody here from ITV. ITV are massively involved with this. So it's not just the BBC. It's not just um, IMG. There's loads of really significant broadcasters. Sky are doing it. Channel 4 are involved. Big production companies, really small production companies. Don't if you're if you think like you're the lone voice in your indie, you're probably not. It's just that no one else has had the nerve or the courage or whatever to say it. So just get out there, get involved, and don't be overwhelmed by what might seem insurmountable at the moment. Just concentrate on little chunks that you can actually do. Great. Okay. Can I ask you all to thank our <coughs> panelists and thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>